who gives this woman to this man? seated. You want to just come this way a little bit. Dear family and friends, we've come into God's presence to join in marriage Jake Michael Heisinger and Sarah Ann Grace Koistra. In doing so, we seek to honor the will of God for marriage, the concern of the Christian church for its well-being, and the interest of the state in the orderly development of society. That we may do so, let us seek God's favor and blessing upon this blessed ceremony. Let's pray together. God our Father, we praise you for making and redeeming us to live together in love. We thank you for the love and trust which bring Sarah and Jake to this, their wedding day. Favor them with the honor of your presence and unite them by your Holy Spirit that together they may reflect the love of Christ for his church and the church's devotion to her Savior. We ask this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let's sing together from our songbooks, our red songbooks, 113B, praise God, O servants of the Lord. 113B, we'll stand and sing all the stanzas. Dear Christian friends, since we have received no lawful objections to this proposed union, 
It's fitting that we call to mind the institution, purpose, and obligations of marriage as taught in God's word. The holy bond of marriage was instituted by God himself at the beginning. God made man after his own image and gave to him the blessing and task to exercise dominion over all things. In so doing, God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And so God created woman of man's own substance, and then he brought her to the man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Our Lord Jesus Christ confirmed the blessedness of marriage. He declared it to be a lasting union when he said, What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. The Apostle Paul shows the exalted significance of marriage when he calls the union of husband and wife a symbol of the mystic union between Christ and his church. Thus we learn that marriage is well-pleasing to God and most honorable to all who maintain it with mutual love and faithfulness. In marriage, as instituted by God, a man and a woman covenant to live together in a lifelong exclusive partnership of love and fidelity. If marriage is to be pleasing in the sight of God, those who enter into this covenant of life must share a common commitment to the Lord of life. In putting his blessing on marriage, God's purpose was to provide a context within which husband and wife can help and comfort each other and find mutual companionship before the Lord, a setting within which they may give loving and tender expression to the desires he gave them, a secure environment within which children may be born and taught to know and serve the Lord, a structure that enriches society and contributes to its orderly function, and a relationship that serves to further his kingdom and bring him glory. Indeed. When these purposes are prayerfully pursued in union with Christ, the kingdom of God is advanced and the blessedness of husband and wife is assured. The institution and purpose of marriage also brings with it obligations for each partner. In Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul admonishes all Christians to develop a mutual respect and love when he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. When he applies this, To the marriage relationship, he instructs the wife to be subject to her husband as the church is subject to Christ, its head. He also instructs the husband to pattern his love for his wife after the example of Christ's love for his body, the church. So Paul says in Ephesians 5, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, and husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In marriage, this requires that the husband and wife serve each other by providing the love, respect, and faith that will enrich their lives together and build a Christ-centered home. Now, our sinful and selfish tendency to break down what God has built threatens marriage with tensions, anguish, and even broken bonds. People who marry in the Lord, however, may trust that he will lead them and graciously provide for their needs when they follow the biblical pattern for love, 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. To desire marriage as instituted by God and ordered according to his word, then, means that we may not enter into it carelessly or from selfish motives, but responsibly and prayerfully. It also means that we must seek God's grace in order that we might faithfully fulfill the obligations and privileges of marriage, both in life's joy and in its trials. And now, Jake and Sarah, understanding that God has instituted, ordered, and blessed the holy union of marriage, do you affirm this biblical teaching, and do you commit yourselves to each other in accordance with it? Jake, how do you answer? 
Sarah, how do you answer? I do. May the Lord confirm the desire and purpose of your hearts, and may your beginning be in the name of the Lord, our Creator and Redeemer. Now I invite you to exchange your vows in the name of the Lord as you make this covenant in his name. <clears throat> I, Jake, take you, Sarah, to be my wife. I promise before God and all who are present here to be your loving and faithful husband. I will love you and give myself up for you, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in riches and in poverty, in sickness and in health. I will serve you with tenderness and respect and encourage you to develop the gifts that God has given you. I will never forsake you as long as you both shall live. I, Sarah, take you, Jake, to be my husband. I promise before God and all who are present here to be your loving and faithful wife. I will love you and submit to you as the church loves and submits to Christ. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in riches and in poverty, in sickness and in health. I will serve you with tenderness and respect and encourage you to develop the gifts that God has given you. I will never forsake you as long as we both shall live. Jake, do you give this ring as a symbol of your constant faithfulness and abiding love? I do. Sarah, do you give this ring as a symbol of your constant faithfulness and abiding love? Now, according to the laws of the province of Ontario and the ordinances of the Church of Christ, I pronounce you, Jake and Sarah, husband and wife, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What therefore God has joined together, let no one separate. From this day forward, as you travel life's pathway together, may the Father of all mercies who of his grace has called you to this holy state of marriage, bind you together in true love and faithfulness, and grant you his blessing. I invite you to kiss your bride. Since we cannot depend on anything in ourselves, we will now go to the Lord in prayer for you and pray with you, and I ask the wedding party to be seated, and then we'll... Take a moment to come to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, grant your blessing to Jake and Sarah in their union as husband and wife. We give you thanks for the vows they have spoken to one another and the pledge of love and fidelity in which they are now united. May they find your love and faithfulness to them the source and blessing for the promises they have expressed. We pray that Jesus Christ will ever reign as the acknowledged head of their home and the master of their lives. Gracious Father, equip them with the Holy Spirit so that they may walk with one another in patience and serve you and each other sacrificially. Work your grace in their marriage 
so that as husband and wife they may express abiding kindness to one another and grant to them a lasting trust in Jesus Christ our Lord so that you are praised whether in life's abundance and joys or in life's burdens and trials. May their home then be a place of joy and security and in times of difficulty, a haven of healing and forgiveness. May they and the children you may be pleased to give them give constant thanks to you. Be pleased, O Lord, to bestow these blessings on them, our Heavenly Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit, our eternal God, is blessed and exalted forever. Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare to open the scriptures together, let's sing number 241 from our songbooks. 241, O God, beyond all praising, and let's stand to sing all the stanzas of 241. Jake and Sarah have chosen as their wedding text Psalm 103, verses 17 and 18. And I invite you to open your Bibles found underneath the first pews and in front of you in the rest of the pews, page 594 in those Bibles, page 594, Psalm 100, 
3. It's fitting that we bless the Lord, our covenant God, together. A Psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it is gone and its place knows it no more. But, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Just look again at verse 17 and 18. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. This is the word of the Lord. May his name be praised. Dear Jake and Sarah, family and friends, there's a first time for everything. And I think this is the first time that I've seen during the the vows, the bridegroom take the flowers of the bride. That's a very special moment. And uh, a good sign of things to come under the Lord's blessing. One of the first things we do in pre-marriage classes is to come up with a definition of marriage. What does the Bible say it is? And I pull at the minds and the hearts of the couple until finally they come up with the one main word I'm looking for. What is that? Oh, I think we need to covenant. Thank you. The Bible's word for marriage, covenant. Marriage is a lifelong, legally binding covenant of love between one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others made in the name of the Lord. A covenant made in the name of the Lord. Maybe we don't use that word a lot, covenant. What is a covenant? It's a legally binding commitment. It's a sworn commitment. You swear to be and to do something for someone. You commit yourselves by oath to love and serve one another as long as your life shall last. It is serious business. Marriage is a covenant in which two become one. God said in the beginning, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. 
Covenants are very important for relationships. They define a relationship. They put boundaries around it. They add security and certainty and stability to a relationship. A covenant brings to a relationship a new level of seriousness and obligation. You commit not to follow your feelings, but to keep your promises even when your feelings are going the other way. But we made a promise. But I made a commitment in the name of the Lord. And yet the sad reality is that there are so many broken covenants. Husbands and wives are often unfaithful to each other. They break their promises, they forsake each other, their love is not very steadfast. And that brings with it an incredible amount of pain and bitterness. And that's why in a world of liars and lies, of people who because of sin have become unreliable, it's so important to know someone, to know someone who is absolutely faithful and completely trustworthy, who never, ever breaks his promises, and to find shelter in that one, so that the promises you make, you can give to him, and say, give me what I need to be faithful to my promises. It's incredibly important to know someone whose love is steadfast. And when he makes a covenant with us to love us, to have us and hold us for better or for worse, to forgive us and be with us in good times and bad, a covenant to empower us that he means what he says. In fact, it's important to know someone who swears even unto death, who says, my love for you is so great that I will even die to save you and protect you. Well, we do know someone like that. Our God, our God. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. God. You see, the more pure a person is, the more sure his word is and the more secure his covenant is. The more pure, the more sure, the more secure. And that's God. Absolutely pure, reliable, and steadfast. The Bible says it's impossible for him to lie that he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he always keeps his word. And if you want to find a safe place for your life, Jake, Sarah, family, and friends, you need to take shelter in this God of the Bible who always keeps his promises, who is with you to the end, when you surrender your life to him and will never leave you nor forsake you. Our God is a God, a covenant God who makes a covenant with his people and when you're in covenant with God, that's a relationship that's absolutely sure and secure. You're safe with him. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll protect you. He'll forgive you. He'll strengthen you to live for him. When he says, I am your God, He means it. In fact, he even commits to be the God of our children and children's children. What a covenant of love. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. The love of God for his people is so sure and steadfast 
that even when we were unfaithful to him and we made ourselves unworthy of him so that he could have and he should have rejected us forever, he was so committed to us that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to earth to take on our flesh and blood, stand in our place, in our broken covenant, in our sin, under God's wrath and punishment to pay for our sin and to fix what was broken, to fix our broken relationship with God. That's how loyal, that's how committed, that's how steadfast God's love is for his children. It's through Jesus, our mediator, that God's covenant with us is guaranteed. So that in Jesus, there's always a place of forgiveness with God. And always a place of renewal, new starts. God's love continues from everlasting to everlasting and from generation to generation for those who trust him love him and fear him and stand in awe of him and want to serve him. Now Psalm 103 is a contrast. The verse starts with, but the steadfast love of the Lord. And God is giving us a radical contrast between him and us. Comparing God's love with man's frailty. It says just before that man's like grass. He's here today, he's gone tomorrow. And because the human race has turned its back on God, on the reliable God, guess what we lost? Reliability, trustworthiness. Because we've turned our back on the true and trustworthy and reliable covenant God, we're inherently weak, sinful, undependable, And all that lives in us is change and decay. Our feelings change, our moods change, our commitments change. And even the covenants we make, though still providing some security in a world filled with liars and lies, even the covenants we make, we easily break. And so the landscape is filled with broken covenants and broken promises, whether it's vows made by politicians, or vows made by corporation executives or doctors, employees, or husbands and wives. Now Jake and Sarah promise making is a beautiful thing because when we make a promise to do something that's right and true, we're imitating our God. It's really a beautiful thing. So it's a way that we resemble our covenant God. Promise making is a beautiful thing, but promise breaking is an ugly thing. And when we do that, we insult, we slander, we blaspheme God. We're contrary to his own character and we invite his anger and judgment. So how we need a refuge from our sins and weaknesses and frailty. And what is that refuge? It's in your text. As we, weak and frail and unreliable human beings, make promises to live together in love, I will never forsake you as long as we both shall live. Like that's an awesome promise and it's an impossible one. Really? Do you mean that? And you can say that with confidence. I will never forsake you as long as we both shall live. When you both commit your lives to the God who says that, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And when you commit your life, your lives, to this faithful covenant God who has sent his son to wash away all our sins so we can always take our failures to him, and who raised his son from the grave on the third day so that we can have the power of a new life and every time we need new strength, we can go to him. Lord, forgive me for failing, for failing my spouse, 
for failing in my calling, failing in the vows that I made, and renew me with strength to live the life that looks like you, God, a promise-keeping life, faithfully loving my spouse, serving her, serving him. Then we go to the source of what we need to be covenant keepers in our marriage. And so God is calling you, Jake and Sarah, in this text to take refuge in the steadfast love of God who makes promises to us and always keeps them. And to put your marriage covenant that you've just made with each other, put that in his hands to empower you through his spirit to keep your promises. Today you made your vows before God. I, Jake, promise before God. You didn't say, I, Jake, promise in the name of Jake to be faithful. There wouldn't be a lot of oomph in that promise. You're a nice guy and all, but you don't have that power. And Sarah, you made your promise. I promise before God, meaning in the name of God, not I promise in the name of Sarah to be faithful to you. Well, you're a great lady and all, but you don't have that. But you said, I promise before God. You're calling on God to be a witness to your vows, but you're also resting on him to enable you to live this out looking for grace every day for the forgiveness of your sins and the renewal of your lives. And to keep this covenant you've made, you may need to go to God a hundred times a day for his strength. The more the better, actually, because he loves that. He delights to show his grace and power in our weakness. But that's how we can flourish in marriage and keep our vows. His love is from everlasting to everlasting. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. And then when we give our lives to him, whose love is steadfast, then he strengthens us also as long as our lives shall last to be faithful. His commitment to you never fails and that gives you confidence to commit to each other. May God bless you richly, Jake and Sarah, in your married life together, and the vows that you've made to reflect the faithful love of Christ for his church and the service of the church to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, in the midst of our weakness and frailty as sinners, we would give up on covenants altogether because there are so many broken promises. But thank you that you have stepped into our covenant breaking with your steadfast love that never fails so that by your love to us and your grace and mercy shown to us and your commitment to us that is everlasting, we may also find the grace that we need to make covenants and to keep them in the name of the Lord. Work that also in Jake and Sarah's life, that they may fear you, that is, call upon you, seek you, look for you, and ask for your blessing upon their lives and strength each day. Lord, go with them and make them a blessing to many as they see the love of Christ for his church and the love of the church for Christ exemplified in their marriage. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, at this time we will demonstrate the legally binding nature of marriage. It's a legally binding Covenant, which in the Bible includes documents, and so we have documents for you to sign as well, to sign your name to the vows that you have just made.
come forward to present the wedding Bible. Well, Jake and Sarah, on behalf of the God's people here at Providence, I have that awesome privilege of presenting you with your wedding Bible. Um, we worship a God who is full of grace, more grace than we can fathom. We worship a God who is full of mercy. His mercies are new every day. We worship a God who is full of peace, a peace that transcends all understanding. And we worship a God who is full of love. He loved you so much that he gave up his only one and only begotten son so that you might be saved. And so we give you this Bible. We ask that you spend much time in it if you want to know more about this God, if you want to grow in that knowledge. And yeah, also go to church, right? So, and with that, congratulations. Thanks, George. Congratulations. Okay. And I did. I did want to just leave you with uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not, on your own, uh, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Okay. He's the treasurer. <laughs> Let's sing together 410, Christian Hearts and Love United, and we'll stand to sing all the stanzas of 410. opportunity to greet Jake and Sarah out in the foyer, no, beyond the foyer, under the carport, and make sure you come in for refreshments. There are some really tasty snacks out there. It's a day of feasting. You put your diet aside and you enjoy the blessings that are found in the back. May God grant us a blessed afternoon and evening. It's now my joy and privilege 
to present to you for the first time, Mr. and Mrs. Jake and Sarah Heisinger. Thank you. 